Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. Um, we have with us today Matthew Connolly, the author of The Declassification Engine, What History Reveals About America's Top Secrets. Very timely. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you to the Commonwealth Club, uh, Professor Connolly, and, uh, and also all those of you who have watched us. We've had almost 1,000 programs since the pandemic began. Uh, we are getting back to in-person programs. Uh, but we're still doing a lot of live streaming uh, as well uh, to, to keep bringing you authors. Now, Matthew is on the East Coast. We are on the West Coast. It makes it very easy to uh, do programs uh, live stream like this. So, again, thanks for, for joining us. And let's talk about that balloon. It's just so fascinating. Um, we were just discussing that how little of the, I mean, amidst all the outrage that the Chinese would do that, there is no comment about our own history of doing similar things, or even the big uh, problem that Eisenhower had when you know uh, Gary Francis Power was was shot down over the Soviet Union. So why don't you tell a little bit about that? Because I think it's a great example of what you're talking about. First of all, that you know, anyway, go on it. It's yeah, it's, it's a great it's a great idea. It, thank you, thank you, George, and it's just terrific to be with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I've been fascinated. I mean, like every other citizen, um, you know, it's quite striking the idea, the reality, right, of of Chinese uh, uh, surveillance balloons, reconnaissance balloons floating overhead. Uh, but you know, as a historian, I also like to put things in perspective and take the long view. Uh, so you know, many people are asking themselves, could this be part of a new Cold War with China? You know, if you look back you know, at the history of the Cold War, I mean, there's, as you said, George, there's the famous example of Gary Powers, uh, a CIA pilot who was shot down over the Soviet Union, you know, flying, you know, hundreds of miles into Soviet airspace. Mm -hmm. uh, for a time, uh, the Eisenhower administration thought it had plausible deniability. They thought that Powers, you know, surely would have died or taken his own life mm -hmm. in the crash. Uh, so the Soviets were quite clever, you know, and in not initially revealing that they had captured the pilot. And so the Eisenhower, Eisenhower personally then was in the humiliating position of, of having then to acknowledge, you know, that indeed this was an American operation. Um, and over time, it was increasingly clear that it was part of a much bigger operation where for years, you know, the United States had been sending these spy planes uh, over the Soviet Union. Uh, doing reconnaissance, taking photographic uh, intelligence, uh, bringing it back to the United States. Now, Eisenhower had a real dilemma because, you know, as many of you know, uh, his critics had said that under his watch, you know, the United States had grown weaker. You know, the Soviets had built more bombers, they built more missiles. And so Eisenhower thought that the only way, you know, to address that kind of argument uh, was by conducting this kind of reconnaissance and showing, you know, that in fact the Soviets had far fewer strategic bombers, far fewer intercontinental ballistic missiles. But while doing this, Eisenhower also knew that he was risking war. And he, in fact, said privately that if the Soviets had tried to overflow the United States, it would be treated as an act of war and the United mm -hmm. States would go to war with the Soviet Union. So there is a long history, and I think it's quite a relevant history. And we could even talk about balloons, George. There, mm -hmm. There's also yeah. a long history of balloon flights where the U.S. sent hundreds of balloons over the USSR in the course of the 1950s. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's fascinating, too, because um, right now with satellite technology, um, and as somebody said, with TikTok uh, collecting all that information, what do they need the balloons for anymore? But, uh, you know. Well, the Soviets, for their part, uh, you know, to my knowledge anyway, maybe – we will one day find out, right, about uh, whether the Soviets ever, you know, were successful in gathering this kind of intelligence uh, before the era of spy satellites, you know, over the United States. But they were incredibly effective, you know, at hacking into American communication systems. Mm -hmm. uh, they infiltrated American embassies, including the embassy in Moscow. Uh, they had listening devices and devices of all kinds uh, that was intercepting American cable traffic between Moscow and Washington during the period, almost the entirety of the period from 1945 up until the mid-1960s. 
the Soviets had real-time intelligence about what was being communicated between Washington and our outpost in Moscow. And so, mm. you know, you could see how it is that in a way, uh, some would argue that it was a good thing because they had the assurance then that the United States was not preparing a surprise attack. At a time in which many Americans were arguing that the United States should strike first while it still had a nuclear advantage. Yeah, that was a very interesting point you made in the book, um, which was that the Soviet Union, having hacked our system and gotten the information, did not respond to what appeared to be about a, a, an almost nuclear attack by us because they knew we were bluffing. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> well, they, <laughs> yeah, I, I make this argument. It's a little unconventional, uh, but, you know, it's it's at the end of a chapter where I describe the various ways which the Soviets could have infiltrated even the National Security Agency itself, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, the holy of holies, right, in terms mm -hmm. of America's top secrets. Uh, so I try to show all the ways in which, in fact, you know, even NSA headquarters were quite vulnerable, you know, to infiltration. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, what we do know, what has been reported is that the Soviets were quite effective, again, in infiltrating American embassies. Uh, but the argument I make here is that, in fact, you know, the revelation of America's top secrets, you know, in fact, provided a measure of assurance. Because, mm -hmm. again, this was a time in which, you know, if the Soviets were only listening to what they could learn from open sources, there were many American elected leaders, uh, there were leaders of the military who were banging the drum year after year, calling for a pr so-called preventative war in which mm -hmm. the United States would have struck the Soviet Union. And let me just add one thing. This was also at a time in which it wasn't just spy planes. You know, in the early 1950s, the United States had squadrons of B-47 bombers, you know, flying over Soviet territory, hundreds and hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, in fact, you know, deep into Soviet territory. And those initial U-2 flights, they were directly over Leningrad and Moscow. Mm -hmm. you now, just imagine how provocative that would have been for the United States if the Soviets were flying directly overhead over our national capital. So again, mm -hmm. I, I think in fa over the longer run, in terms of the you know history of the planet, right, and life on mm -hmm. Earth, it was probably a good thing, you know, that the Soviets managed to hack into American communications, at least in terms of reducing the risk of nuclear war. I don't want to push you too far out on a limb here, but um, having read your book and, and and all the different things that the United States did, of course, you didn't, don't have access to all the records in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. but. Uh, which, which side do you think uh, was most irresponsible in their actions, um, you know, in, in, in trying to provoke uh, the other side to do something during, during the Cold War? Or yeah, is, it so, about, is it about an equal game? Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, I mean, there are still things we're learning, you know, even about mm -hmm. things like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but, you know, just to take the Cuban Missile Crisis, because nobody mm -hmm. has been able to reveal you know, any, you know, crisis in the whole course of the Cold War where the risk of nuclear war was greater, you know, than in October of 1962. And, you know, I have to say, like, having spent a lot of time looking at a lot of the evidence uh, that if anything, you know, after the initial, you know, move when Khrushchev, you know, in a very provocative way, of course, and against Soviet mm -hmm. assurances, you know, deployed intermediate medium range ballistic missiles to Cuba, after, you know, that was discovered, uh, the Americans were quite aggressive, you know, in the way in which, uh, in some cases, they exploited that situation, because you know there were many, again, many in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, like notoriously uh, General Curtis LeMay, you mm -hmm. know, who wanted a, an attack on the Soviet Union, saw the Cuban situation as a perfect, you know, uh, cause for war, um, and it wasn't just LeMay. I mean, one thing to note, and I think it may be what you're thinking of, George, is mm -hmm. uh, it was also uh, Thomas Power the head of Strategic Air Command in 1962, mm -hmm. who raised the threat level to the highest level it was ever at, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just short of actual nuclear war. And what's surprising about it then and now is that, you know, he must have known that this would have been incredibly worrisome to their Soviet counterparts, because after all, by doing so, the United States was you know, fueling up our bombers. They were dispersed, you know, to American airports like Kennedy Airport and so on. They were American strategic bombers ready to lift off. They also uh, were fully armed with nuclear weapons. So in doing so, the United States was, was giving itself a big advantage. If it had mm -hmm. come to war, the United States would have been able to launch, you know, the full weight of its thermonuclear arsenal at a time in which it had an enormous superiority against the Soviet Union. So power issued that alert 
in the clear. He broadcast that around the world, right? And in mm -hmm. so doing, I think he had to know that there was at least the risk that the Soviets then would have decided you know, that the risk was too great and they would have had to launch their own you know, so-called preemptive attack. Mm -hmm. uh, one other example, and this is something that started to become better known, um, you know, the US Navy in enforcing what President Kennedy called a quarantine was ruthless in hunting down uh, Soviet submarines, even to the point where they were dropping what they called practice depth charges, mm -hmm. but which felt very real you know, for, for Soviet uh, sailors. And we know now that you know one of these submarines was at the point of launching a tactical nuclear submarine against an American carrier group and had to be talked out of it. There was one officer who had to sign off on this, refused to. If that one man, I believe his name was Sergei Arkhipov, if he had not mm -hmm. withheld his permission, then we would have had nuclear war in 1962. That would have likely meant global thermonuclear war with hundreds of millions of people dead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Curtis LeMay was the uh, the uh, model for Doctor Strangelove, right? Isn't that isn't that what people say? Well, no one knows for sure. <laughs> it's a dubious <laughs> distinction, right? I mean, yes, some people yes. think you know the character resembled a little bit Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because you know Strangelove was you know a doctor, and mm -hmm. you know he was also a, an expert, right, in nuclear weapons, just mm -hmm. as Henry Kissinger was when he, when he started mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, he reminds me a little bit more like the, you know, if you remember the the captain of that bomber, right, who rides right. his weapon, you know, LeMay was a little bit like that. You know, he, he was really uh, gung-ho um, mm -hmm. and, you know, believed deeply, right, in the, in the idea, you know, that the, the best defense was a good offense. Right. And so when, you know, during that period, the United States was flying squadrons of bombers over the Soviet Union, over Soviet airspace, you know, for him, that was the guarantee. That was how the United States was going to detect if the Soviets were planning to attack. And his plan all along, whether anybody gave him permission or not, mm -hmm. his plan was to strike and strike first. Yeah, yeah. One of the interesting points in your in your book also was that at, at, when Eisenhower was president, the, the decision to drop nuclear weapons was uh, delegated uh, to lower levels um, and that, that they had the final decision. That's right. Um, that was interesting. Yeah, and it's an example, you know, of, of history where we wouldn't know for sure, like if we weren't able to find the actual, you know, orders, or we knew that those documents existed, it wasn't easy. Uh, and this wasn't my work. I mean, in fact, uh, this was something that uh, during the Kennedy administration. Uh, a young uh, civilian advisor named Daniel Ellsberg mm. uh, decided that he was going to try to track down uh, something that until then the military had denied existed. You know, these mm -hmm. so-called pre-delegation orders where it turned out, you know, that Dwight Eisenhower uh, had decided that local commanders would have the authority to launch nuclear weapons if they came under attack. And up and down, they swore one after another that such orders did not exist and so Ellsberg had to go around to American military bases until he was finally able to establish, in fact, that these orders did exist. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the Kennedy administration was able, you know, to try to regain control, you know, over this, the ultimate weapon. For those who aren't aware, Daniel Ellsberg is also responsible for the Pentagon Papers that, that, that released all the information about the Vietnam War mm -hmm. um, and is a, is a Bay Area icon. Uh, so... You mentioned lots of things there that I want to follow up on. In your book, you talk about Henry Kissinger and, and you talk about redaction. I, I, the, the project, I think we want to describe your project here because you, you talk about using computers, big data to analyze things. And you have a team and, and I'm sure lots of computers that work on this. And one of your projects was to look at all the secrets that have been revealed, used to be redacted and then have been unredacted. Mm -hmm. And use that information to reverse engineer, maybe a way of putting it, what's still redacted and try to figure out what's in there. And one of the things that you mentioned was that Henry Kissinger is redacted twice as often as the second person on that list in terms of individuals. Yeah, that's right. Um I, this was something, you know, I, you know, if you know me, uh, mm -hmm. I'm very much a product of a liberal arts education and, uh, <laughs> you know, math was never my strong point. I joined mm -hmm. the computer club when I was in high school and I quickly quit and dropped out because I mm -hmm. knew I was just not very good at it. But I realized when I started working on this project that, you know, more and more of the evidence that historians are working with is born digital. 
you know, beginning mm. of the 1970s, the United States was an early adopter of electronic record systems. So we now have tens of millions, you know, or eventually we will have, one would hope, you know, tens of millions of, of just State Department cables, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just imagine back in the day, you know, when say Henry Kissinger, you know, was reading these cables, they would have been filed away in a file cabinet. And decades later, you know, as an historian, you think I could walk into an archive and eventually anyway, you know, I'll be able to look through those same files and feel those same pieces of paper you know mm -hmm. that Henry Kissinger held in his hands but that world is passing away because you know as we all know in our own work you know how many of us still have you know file cabinets you know stuffed with papers I mean I do you know mm -hmm. because I like having everything in paper and filed and organized in that way but more yeah. and more what we're dealing with with large organizations including the United States government they deal in data right and they have vast databases and so if you want to find things and find interesting things you can't just start you know pawing through paper files you have to begin using data science tools to discover things. Now, the great thing about it, and the reason why I went back to school, you know, and, and learned at least a little bit, I learned uh, how to code again, is because you can do things that nobody could do before. So you could, for example, and that's the, the case I'm thinking of, you know, as a little project for my summer programming course, I wanted to see like who it was uh, whose name was most likely, you know, to be mentioned in the context of redacted information, information that's mm -hmm. still withheld from us, the American people. And as, as you said, George, you know, Henry Kissinger far and away, not just that he's more often in these documents, it's that, you know, he's disproportionately likely to be in the room, so to speak, when things are being discussed that even now we're not allowed to know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. As you said, Henry Kissinger's name is on this paper and a bunch of redacted information is on the paper. And that's how you you added it together, right? You, you, you yeah. search for documents that had a name of somebody that you were searching for and right. a lot of redacted material. Yeah. And in that case, like that was something that I could do or even, you know, an undergraduate could mm -hmm. do, you know, with uh, tools that are really not too hard to learn. But to get beyond that and to get at, you know, what's still redacted, right, mm -hmm. um, that takes some pretty sophisticated data science. So we were very fortunate to have uh, some top flight um, computer scientists and statisticians. And we had a terrific um, PhD student in computer science. He went on to be a, a professor at Harvard. And one of his projects was to use what they call computer vision. That is, you know, how it is that computers can read, you know, uh, visual information. In this case, read redactions, automatically mm -hmm. detect redactions. And then also use something called natural language processing, you know, which is where you can begin to use text as data, right? Written words, mm -hmm. and you can be analyzing them computationally. And through a combination of these methods, he was able to find thousands of examples of documents where you have one version that's redacted and the other one isn't. And so mm -hmm. what he did was he began analyzing all the texts that we can now uh, read, you know, or at least, you know, eventually <laughs> when there are thousands of them, but which computers, of course, you know, can analyze instantaneously. And you can begin to extract the names of people, places, and organizations in that redacted text. And so you can begin to tell, you know, who is it or what is it that's disproportionately likely, you know, to be redacted in these documents the U.S. government declassifies. Something while you were talking just struck me as a possibility. Uh, you said computer vision. I mean, obviously, the, the computers can see much better than we can. There, mm -hmm. there must be, a, I mean, when they redact it, they just use a black magic marker or whatever they do to, to cover it up. Yeah. If there was typed words underneath it, I would think that the computer would be able to tell the difference and just see what we can't see anymore. Yeah, so I should tell you, George, that, you know, I just shouldn't, to I shouldn't mention that, right? <laughs> yes, George, now we're all in trouble. Everybody <laughs> listening is in trouble. No, what I wanted to say is that you're right. Uh, and in fact, people have used techniques where they calculate probabilities, you know, given mm -hmm. the character space, you know, underneath the redaction. Right. You know, in many cases, like if you know it's a location and you may have like a limited list of names that might possibly be, yeah, there are people who who have done such things and they've discovered things that have been embarrassing for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. I believe in one case they were able to confirm uh, that the United States deployed nuclear missiles to Japanese territory. Mm -hmm. So the United States, I believe even to this day, still has a policy you know, uh, of not acknowledging that the U.S. has ever deployed any nuclear weapons of any kind to Japanese territory. Right. Uh, because this is something that the Japanese government takes very seriously. And Japanese governments, you know, would fall, you know, if they ever acknowledge that they permitted the United States to deploy nuclear weapons on their territory. But that's not what we were doing. Um, mm -hmm. What we were doing, you know, was trying to learn what we could from information that has been declassified. 
You know, it's one way you can you can stay out of trouble is if uh, if you don't mess, you know, with with leaked information and you yeah. don't try, you know, at least, you know, at, to this point, we haven't tried to predict what lies beneath redactions that still exist. What we can do, though, is tell you that of the redactions that have been revealed, we can begin analyzing it at, at scale. We can look at thousands of examples. Um, and when you can begin, you know, to use computer vision to look at millions of declassified documents, you absolutely can see patterns and anomalies that would be invisible to you otherwise. One of your interesting comments, which is not too surprising for people who've looked into this, but I think maybe surprising for others, mm -hmm. is that the vast majority of things that are kept secret are due to either incompetence or criminality. Um, and, and I was wondering, um, because Henry Kissinger um, was at the top of the list, whether you thought it was more incompetence or more criminality in history. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so, you know, it's hard to measure incompetence and criminality, right? So, yeah. you know, the research that we've done, and, and you can find a lot of this, by the way, if you want to, you know, even if you don't want to pay the money to buy the book, the declassification engine, you can go to our website. It's history-lab.org. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll find is that uh, we present a lot of the data that we have, and you can find things, for example, like, you know, in the 1950s or the 70s, for that matter, you know, what were the topics that tended to be classified at the highest levels, right? Mm -hmm. and, and also, like, more simply, what did American policymakers spend most of their time on? Like, were they mainly concerned with things like international aid and trade, you know, or were they spending more time on negotiating, you know, covert operations and whatnot? And so, you know, that kind of information, I think, is something you couldn't even begin to measure unless you started to use these kinds of techniques, you know, because even if you're a quick reader, you know, mm -hmm. even if you spent, like me, you spent decades looking at declassified documents, you're never going to be able to, to look at millions of them right? Mm -hmm. And instantly recall and make comparisons one to another. Now, you know, when you ask about incompetence and, and criminality, again, it's a little hard to code that, right? In a mm -hmm. way that computers can measure. But what you can do is you can find many, many examples where clear cut examples where yes, you know, individuals were engaged in criminal behavior and knew that they were, and they used the secrecy system to cover their tracks. I'll just mm -hmm. give you one case. Um, you know, to me, it's it's one of the worst cases of all. A lot of us know about how the U.S. government carried out uh, experimentation on human subjects, right, mm -hmm. for many years, uh, and this included children, uh, elderly people, homeless people, prisoners. I mean, people who were vulnerable. Like in some cases, you know, people who thought that they were terminally ill turned out not to be actually, mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't know in many cases that they were unwitting subjects of, of human experiments. Now, early on in this program. The architects of these of this program realized that they were subject, you know, to uh, legal um, uh, risk, right? Whether mm -hmm. you know it was a, a matter of people, you know, uh, finding uh, good lawyers and finding damages uh, and suing the government, or even criminal prosecution in some cases. And so there's a memo where you rarely see this kind of thing in writing, but where they said it's precisely because of that legal risk that they knew that everything related to that program that wasn't already classified had to be classified. Mm -hmm. And what I find even more interesting was they did this exactly the same moment that the Nuremberg Tribunal was happening, uh, mm -hmm. where Nazi doctors you know, were being tried, and in some cases you know, sentenced to death for carrying out experimentation on unwitting human subjects. And so, you know, it was then that American doctors produced what we now call the Nuremberg principles as to how it is you're supposed to ethically conduct research. So these are examples of people who knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they were breaking the law and they were using this system, what was still actually a new system to keep information from the public in order to, uh, to do so without any consequences. Yeah, it was a pretty widespread scientific research, you know, which which everybody would condemn nowadays, uh, not only in Germany, but the Japanese doctors in northern uh, China and Mongolia that did this terrible research, even even worse than the Nazi doctors. Mm -hmm. And the, the tough thing about that, when the Soviet Union took over that area in the United States, uh, the Soviet Union put those doctors that they had on trial. But the United States used those doctors' information for a program that they were working on, you know, to, to develop the same kind of things. So, uh, again, it was a different time and a different uh, um, maybe fear level about, about, you know, survival. Are we going to survive in this, in this new world? And we have to do everything we can to survive sort of thing. And we've calmed down a little bit, I hope. Um, but well, 
I mean, as a historian, you know, uh, you, you can't understand people unless you try to see the world from their point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I absolutely agree with you, George, you know, we have to be careful, you know, about imposing, you know, our own, you know, uh, systems of ethics um, at, in another time, right, in a different context, because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's true that uh, many of the people I'm talking about, like Curtis LeMay, for example, you know, mm -hmm. he thought that if he if he was not prepared to strike the first blow, that American cities would be devastated, the United States would be overrun. So he really did think there was existential reasons why it is mm -hmm. that he had to take the stance that he did. Now, having said that, you know, in the case of, of uh, these, uh, you know, this experimentation, this started even before the Cold War. Right. Um, I mean, people were doing this uh, before there really was a, a threat, at least a military military threat from the Soviet Union, in fact, at a time in which the United States had an atomic uh, monopoly. Um, and the reason I mentioned the Nuremberg Tribunal is that it shows that they knew you know, what was ethical and what wasn't, and what right. might even be criminal, uh, because it was in the headlines at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and just one other comparison, at the same time, you know, there were also government scientists who were conducting experimentation in biological warfare. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, they took great care to make sure that the people uh, who they were experimenting on knew the risks and that they were informed um, mm -hmm. and that they had their consent. And so, you know, there, there are, you know, as you say, there, there, uh, for historians, it's important, you know, that we be empathetic and understand the context and, and how people, you know, understood what they were doing and, and that we not impose our standards retroactively. But the last thing I'll say, like, I'd like to think that we've all calmed down. <laughs> that we're, li we're living in different and better times. But I was quite struck. It's why it's in my chapter on, on I call it weird science, you know, secrets yeah. and a stranger than fiction. But the the people who were hired to carry out waterboarding, you know, interrogation mm -hmm. uh, right. at black sites, they also thought of themselves as scientists. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, conducted these interrogations in a way that they thought, you know, represented uh, experiments, right? So they thought it was very important. We collect data. We measure exactly how much water we're, we're do you know, we're pouring over the mouths of these yeah. people, how much splashes off. And and they likened it to uh, experiments with with animals, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and they were experimenting on human beings who, in some cases, we know now, sadly, were completely innocent. You know, we're mm -hmm. not actually terrorists, right? And so, so I think that, you know, unless we have confidence that we can hold people to account, even if it takes decades, as, unless we know that historians someday, you know, will be able to look back and, and have a full account of what actually happened, I think we, we can really have confidence, right, that, that people yeah. working in secrecy now are going to observe ethical standards and avoid illegal activity. Yeah, I think it's a great point, especially on the torture um, issue, because when we're when we were afraid after 9-11, uh, we resorted to it. And uh, it was exactly why Turkey was kept out of the you know European Union for 40 years, because they admitted that they did it. Um, and yes, I'm sure that everybody did a little bit of it, some here, some there and stuff like that. But right. everybody denied it. And I, I, unfortunately, I think it's much better when you deny it and try to cover it up and are ashamed of it, then when you say, no, we need to do this, yeah. that makes it, that makes it, you know, and, and what's, what's interesting is that the secrecy surrounding it, in this case, hides the incompetence of not only the awfulness of it, but the incompetence of it, it doesn't produce information. You keep saying it does, but the information is that it doesn't produce information. And, and because we did it after 9-11, you know, I, I, I said to friends at the time, I said, you know, it's going to be three years. And we're going to have television shows where all the police torture people immediately and get information exactly out of them. And pretty soon, everybody's just going to get used to this. And that's not the way it works. And it's awful, you know. And yeah. so it's just, it's, yeah. Right. And your, your, I mean, your information they, shows that, too. Yeah. yeah, the Senate report, I mean, long before I wrote my book, I think the Senate mm -hmm. report, you know, showed clearly. And also an internal CIA study, mm -hmm. you know, showed that, in fact, the FBI interrogators you know, using good detective work, right? And classic methods of how you, you know, you form a connection, a relationship, you know, mm -hmm. with the person you're trying to get information from, they got far more information, more quickly, more effectively, more uh, reliable information than anyone ever did, you know, using, using torture. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's worse than a crime, a blunder, right? And it, it's also made many of these people, some people who really were monsters. I mean, let's yeah. face it. I mean, some of the people they took into custody and were torturing in some cases did heinous and horrible things. But in some cases, it's going to be impossible to put them on trial, right? Mm -hmm. Because we tortured them. 
Right. right. So, so there's so many ways I think that we should have learned, you know, from the history. And there was already, a, unfortunately, a long history of torture and lessons that could have been learned, but but they chose to ignore at the time. Well, I think that's a, that's an important point. I mean, there's always historians and and other ac academics and people in government and et cetera, all of whom understand the principle of why you don't do this and why you do do this, and and even understand the practicalities of it. That's yeah. a blunder and it's incompetent and so on. Right. But but they they don't always you know win the persuasion game uh, with the with the decision makers. And, um, and George, in in that case, you know, uh, not only were they not you know learning from the history of efforts to use torture to get information from terrorists, like there was for decades, like the Algerian War, for example, there there was right. a long history of this, and they could have learned from that history. But then they willfully destroyed the evidence. Um, you know, as we know now, um, you know, the CIA, including like the future CIA director, Gina Haspel, decided mm -hmm. that they didn't want this to exist anymore. They, mm -hmm. they didn't want the, even the chance, you know, that one day, maybe 50 or 100 years later, you know, somebody would be able to see these videos, right, to form yeah. judgments about, about what had actually happened. And, you know, I remember uh, that I attended an event as, as a young professor. It was at uh, the Gerald Ford Library uh, in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. Michigan. Um, I was just starting out and uh, George Tenet, the CIA director, uh, came to talk about how much the agency cared about history, how much he wanted to learn history. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember, you know, I couldn't help myself. I got up and I said, well, if that's the case, then why has the CIA over and over again destroyed, you know, huge quantities of historical records, public <laughs> records that belong to you and me, the American people? And he was a little, he didn't know what to say, right? But he said, yeah. yes, that was before my time. It'll never happen again. And lo and behold, what happened, right? It's just a couple of years later, right? Once again, the CIA doing something it was ashamed of. And so rather than, you know, at least preserve the record, right? So people could learn from it, they just destroyed it, right? So yeah. nobody can learn anything. And again, to me, that is like the ultimate form of secrecy, just erasing the record entirely so nobody will ever know. Yeah, I mean, you made the point in your book as well, and and it's you know as you said, incompetence and criminality. And in the case of torture, it's both, you know, and and so you you, it, it doesn't work. And what your actions are, would under under normal circumstances be considered criminal. Um, so uh, I don't want to disparage uh, you know uh, somebody who has such a great reputation overall, but I thought your little clip about uh, what General MacArthur did when he left the Philippines needs to be told you know because there's there's people on both sides is he is he a great man or is he was a, a bad man and everything like that at least oh, he yeah. did this one thing tell that story <laughs> <laughs> I, I was amazed myself and i yeah. have to say uh i actually learned this in the course of uh reading my wife's research uh, my wife wrote a book mm -hmm. called prisoners of the empire it's a uh -huh. fantastic history of uh the imprisonment of american pow's during the pacific war and and australian and british pow's and so on so you know i was reading what she was finding uh about you know this famous episode where uh you know the united states was um uh, in retreat um general macarthur was commanding american and filipino forces uh, they were surrounded, right, at first in the Bataan, mm -hmm. uh, and then driven to uh, the island of Corregidor as the last foothold. Um, and, you know, MacArthur, in that circumstance, uh, you know, he thought that, in fact, it might be best for the U.S. to withdraw and mm -hmm. allow the Philippines to become neutral territory. So the, the Roosevelt administration was really quite worried. You know, they were afraid that MacArthur, you know, instead of, you know, fighting to the death, right, and providing an example, you know, for the United States back home, uh, that he might actually, you know, surrender his command or even mm -hmm. accept a, a humiliating withdrawal, right? Where, of mm -hmm. course, it, they would have to withdraw under Japanese guns and willingly give over, you know, the Philippines, what had until then been an American colony, hand mm -hmm. it over to the Empire of Japan. And so they were quite worried about what he might do. So what did MacArthur do? Uh, he demanded uh, that the president of the Philippines transfer what would now be millions of dollars to his private banking account back in New York. Mm -hmm. And that was the condition uh, that he imposed uh, to allow the president of the Philippines to escape uh, and set up a government in exile uh, together with his family. Right. Remember, you mm -hmm. know, this was a moment when it wasn't just the president of the Philippines at the time. It was also his wife and two daughters who were mm -hmm. with him. And he had to know that, you know, if he didn't escape that island, that they would all be in the hands of the Japanese. Right. right? And so, like, to me, it was just astonishing 
right? The, mm-hmm. you know, I won't use the word, but I think a lot of us can imagine, you know, the the bravado to put it that way. You know, mm-hmm. somebody in those circumstances making these kinds of demands. Now, it was for that reason, you know, that uh, MacArthur then, you know, I think had the sense of security uh, when in the Korean War once again he decided that he would uh, be insubordinate. Uh, mm-hmm. and begin to undermine the authority of the commander-in-chief. In this case, it was Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman. Um, so he began talking openly right, about how it is that he wanted to start a war, a bigger war, uh, with China. And mm-hmm. in fact, he, you know, it would appear, we don't have all the facts, but it appears that he even dispatched you know, an American uh, warship uh, to Chinese territorial waters and trained its guns you know, on the uh, uh, city uh, in order to provoke a Chinese attack. Because mm-hmm. MacArthur thought, I think the only way you can make sense of it is because MacArthur, I think, concluded that was the way he could start this war with China, the much bigger war with all of China and the Soviet Union that he wanted uh, in 1950. And so, you know, th- here again, I think MacArthur, you know, thought that he could get away with it. Uh, mm-hmm. And he almost did. I mean, in fact, it w- when Truman removed him from his command, it was the most unpopular thing that Truman ever did as president. Mm -hmm. Uh, And after that, his reputation never recovered. He's still, I think, the most unpopular president in American history, at least as long as we have opinion polls to measure it. Mm -hmm. MacArthur, on the other hand, returned to ticker tape parades in Mm -hmm. New York City and told everyone that, you know, there was no substitute for victory. Um, Mm -hmm. And he then, you know, uh, took up residence in the Waldorf Astoria. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. and spent the rest of his life living in the Waldorf Astoria, the fanciest hotel in New York, because, mm-hmm. of course, he was independently wealthy. Right. Truman, on the other hand, back then, presidents didn't even have a pension. Mm-hmm. So Truman had to retire in relative poverty, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was a powerful lesson to other flag officers at the time. I make this part of my chapter on right. what I call the dirty secret of civil, civil military relations, the way, unfortunately, all too many generals and admirals learned from this and learned how it is that they could defy civilian control to advance their own agendas. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as you say, it, it didn't turn out to be a seven days in May sort of um, uh, approach to things. Seven days in May being a famous novel and movie from the 50s uh, and early 60s, I think, the movie. But um, but that it was just a slow deterioration over time. Um, otherwise, it would have been much more provocative if, if, if yeah. they had followed that rule. Right. Oh, I, I make. Yeah, I I, uh, I discussed the film because, uh, interestingly, John F. Kennedy, when he was president, uh, he helped them to film that. Uh, one way he did that was he uh, decided he would uh, schedule a trip out of town. I think he mm-hmm. went to Hyannisport at a time in which they were trying to uh, film, you know, one of the scenes from Seven Days in May, this uh, Hollywood portrayal of a attempted military coup in the United States. They mm-hmm. wanted to film a riot in front of the White House. Mm-hmm. So the president had to, back then anyway, the president had to leave town if mm-hmm. they were going to have even a fictional riot in front of the, the White House. <laughs> um, and and Kennedy also said that if you, he was asked, you know, what advice would you have for a successor? And he said, I would tell them to watch the generals. You know, mm-hmm. because Kennedy was himself just shocked and appalled at how frequently and brazenly uh, the military was defying uh, his um, uh, commands. And there are just so many examples like this. And I think there are probably many more. But I'll tell you, George, we're never going to know all of it because the Joint Chiefs of Staff decided to destroy all of their records. Mm-hmm. In the early 1970s, they began to realize with the Pentagon Papers case and the Freedom of Information Act that had just been passed a few years before, they began to realize records of their meetings might one day become public. And mm-hmm. so they destroyed, it's the only way I can explain it, they, they mm-hmm. destroyed all of the records, all their meetings going all the way back to World War II. Mm-hmm. And henceforth, they decided they would never again keep a written record of what they said in the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Wow. You know, it, it's a little bit like, imagine, you know, in this case, we have an $800 billion department. They're running it like a numbers racket. They don't want to put anything to paper. I mean, I'm only exaggerating a little, but just <laughs> ask yourself. I mean, the things that have come out, like Operation Northwoods, are pretty shocking, right? Mm-hmm. And so they had to know, you know, that if they did destroy all the records, people like me, would just endlessly speculate about what more it is that we will never find out. And they had to make the decision that, in fact, the worst thing that we could imagine was better than what they actually destroyed. What they actually destroyed. I mean, otherwise, I can't make sense of it. Maybe you can, but I can't. Well, you know, let's let's give the generals a little bit of credit here for just a second. Um, in under when Trump was the president, 
there was lots of um, comments about how the generals were the ones that stopped him. I mean, he surrounded himself with generals and former generals. The generals were the ones that put any brakes on him at all. Um, so um, the grownups. That's the room, too right? recent. That's too recent for for your your research, right? But right. but there's also a lot of people thinking. Well, what about the Russian generals? You know, which Russian general is going to put the brakes on on Putin and say, you know, we we really can't do what you say we're going to do, and this isn't working. Well, you know, um, George, uh, if listeners, if they uh, and viewers, if if you read the book, you'll know by the end of it exactly what I think of Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, after all, you know, this was a president who tore up his papers into tiny little pieces and yeah. flushed them down the toilet. That's what he thought of your and my right to have a public record of his actions. That's that's how much respect he had you know, for the, the rule of law, the Presidential Records Act, that's supposed to preserve a record of the decisions of our elected leaders. Now, having said that, I was really dismayed. I was very unsettled, you know, at the way in which so many of my friends, you know, were looking to the military, right, to protect mm -hmm. us against yeah. a would-be tyrant. And I was fearful, you know, because I thought, well, they may be right. I mean, it could be in a constitutional crisis. It may be that at the end of the day, like, you know, other republics we're going to need the military you know to preserve rule of law but oh my god is that really how far we got as a country when we got to the point where we thought that you know if only for the joint chiefs of staff we would be living under a tyranny now i i also think that some of the things that uh have come out both at the time, because this was also the leakiest administration in history, uh, mm -hmm. but also more that's come out subsequently in all these memoirs that they wrote. We, we found out that there were many people in government who were deliberately trying to thwart uh, the president's will mm -hmm. um, on a range of, of policy decisions. Now, whatever you think you know, of, of some of the things that Donald Trump was trying to do, at least if we're talking about the things he was trying to do that were legal, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think most of us would agree that a president, you know, as long as they're, you know, observing their constitutional responsibilities and they're not contravening the law, they ought to be able, you know, to run the executive branch. I mean, mm -hmm. after all, who elected these generals, right, to thwart right. the president's will? And once, you know, and I think, unfortunately, they were already in the habit of doing so. And they've been doing this for many decades already. Mm -hmm. If you look mm -hmm. back at other cases like Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I mean, there are countless mm -hmm. examples of the military deliberately thwarting, you know, the uh, efforts of elected leaders, you know, to carry out what they thought was the will or the mandate of the American people. But just imagine, you know, do we really want them in the habit, you know, of, of defying presidents? The last example I'll give is the, the general who's in charge of American strategic forces, nuclear forces. You know, he was asked during the Trump administration, you know, what would happen if he was, you know, given the order by the president to launch American nuclear forces? And he basically said, you know, that he, you know, would have to think about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, I mean, those weren't his exact words, but yeah. he was at pains to say, you know, that, of course, you know, we would only follow a law uh, or an order, rather, if it was a legal order, uh, that there were, uh, you know, procedures in place if any other, any such order were ever given. But I tell you, George, in fact, there is no law other mm. than the laws of war. There is no law that would prevent currently would prevent a president from ordering a nuclear strike on another country for almost any reason they chose to give. Mm -hmm. uh, there are procedures in place, but they were put in place by Barack Obama, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are supposed to, according to these rules, they're supposed to consult with the Secretary of Defense. They're supposed mm -hmm. to alert the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But even according to these rules, it could be a one minute conversation. Right. They could say, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, but I'm going to go ahead and nuke China, and I don't care what you say about it. Right. And there is not a law on the land that would stop them. So the fact that we had a general in charge of American forces who was basically saying that he might not follow a presidential order just tells you like where we are as a country. Yeah. Uh, one little aside there, you, you mentioned a while back that President Trump liked to rip up his papers, and I was wondering if Nancy Pelosi was working for him when she ripped up his, uh, his speech behind him. <laughs> um, after after his State of the Union speech, since we just had a State of the Union speech, so maybe Nancy and Trump were working together. Maybe not. Well, in that case, <laughs> in that case, the difference I would draw, and it's an important one, is that of course there were countless copies of that speech of that just happened to be her copy, right? <laughs> Whereas the papers that Trump was ripping up, we have no idea what they were, whether there are any copies of them anywhere.
But you had another example, which I thought was a, a very interesting way that the, the military got around in the presidential order. And that was when Kennedy found out that there was no no check upon the the, the nuclear uh, things. And so he he had to, he wanted uh, codes put in place that would stop it. And you have to put the code in. And the way that they uh, dealt with that was to make a code that was, you know, I mean, an eight digit code and the eight digit eight code zeros. Was eight zeros, <laughs> eight zeros. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's oh, you have to either laugh or cry, right? And yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, so in this case, it's it's just as you said, George. So, so President Kennedy worried, you know, at the fact that there were a lot of American nuclear weapons all over the world. You know, mm. you had, for example, you had uh, German, you know, fighter bomber pilots taking off with American nuclear weapons strapped under their wings and exercises. You mm. know, and, and when there was a, a Senate committee that investigated the state of affairs, they asked. There was only a single American private with a rifle. And they asked him, so what kind of security can you provide if one of these German pilots takes off and decides to use one of those American weapons, you mm -hmm. know, a, in a way that the president hasn't authorized? And he said, well, I try to shoot out the tires. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Kennedy was was pretty upset when he heard about this. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't just the threat of unauthorized use. It was also the threat of sabotage. I mean, theft. I mean, there were many mm -hmm. things. And so he he said he directed Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, he said, I need you to come up with a system where only the president can give the, the order, right? And and not some, you know, uh, whether it's a German pilot, you know, an American mm -hmm. lieutenant, you know, can can use nuclear weapons on their own authority. And so the the military protested long and hard. And they made the argument, it's not an unreasonable argument. They said, you know, if you make it too difficult to use nuclear weapons, then if it comes to war, then we really need to use those weapons. You may make it so cumbersome and difficult, we're not going to be able to use them. They're, they may be destroyed on the ground. But what mm -hmm. they did in the end is they created this uh, system at the time, it was electromechanical locks, where essentially somebody would have to know what the eight-digit code was and enter it in in order to, in this case, like launch an intercontinental ballistic missile. So it's like you said, George, what did they do? They set the numbers to zero. All of them were yeah. zero. It's imagine like you're in my pin. Right, right exactly. When we go to the bank, right? Let's make it all zeros, right? All zeros. One, two, three, four are all zeros. One. <laughs> yeah. One um, to eight would have been too hard, maybe. Yeah. Well, we got a question from our audience, uh, which is interesting. I, I want to uh, switch over to your, to your. Uh, now, now we have all the nice, good facts in here that you <laughs> had to switch over to what the declassification engine is what it is that you're, you're talking about with this data. But the question before that is, is there any story or additional info you wish you could have added to your book that you had to leave out for whatever reason that was like a, an, an interesting story? Oh, well, you know, I had to put the book to bed uh, this past summer. Mm -hmm. And so it was before actually, uh, I mean, it, it was, we'd, we'd found out, you know, about how former President Trump had taken these classified records with him to, to Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. So we already knew it was at least possible, right, that we were going to have a former president indicted. It mm -hmm. could still happen, you know? Right. Um, and, and by the way, you know, according to the sentencing guidelines, he could face significant jail time. Like if mm -hmm. he were treated the same way that many other people have been treated, even when they've been found, you know, not not trying to spy or sell their secrets, right. people have been found to have mishandled classified information, taken it home, et cetera, have been sentenced in many cases to significant jail terms, you know, in yeah. federal penitentiaries. That could still happen. But, you know, I didn't know that Joe Biden, you know, was <laughs> also in possession of classified <laughs> records. Uh, I didn't know that he kept them, you know, in his office at uh, at Penn's Washington Center. I didn't know that he kept them next to his Corvette. I didn't know that Mike Pence had some of these records as well. But I think if you read the book, you'll see that I describe how this system has been out of control for mm -hmm. a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm now, you know, in the fortunate position of, of finding that, you know, every day it seems more evidence emerges you know, for, for something that I think has been building and growing and exploding for, for many decades. Well, you know, the, the, the tough thing about that, for, that, that I think of right away is all the foreign governments who are our allies, mm -hmm. who, who must say, we can't trust those people with our information. Yeah. And, you know, Henry Kissinger had that kind of concern. And yeah. so did Richard Nixon about the, uh, and it's a legitimate concern, you know, because mm -hmm. I think most of us would agree you know, uh, I, th I think you would know, George, right, from from the negotiations that you engage with, high mm -hmm. stakes negotiations, you try to conduct them in public, you're not going to no. get anywhere, right? I mean, That's it right. doesn't work, right? I think we all know, you know, that some of the most sensitive, important things 
You know, they have to be kept confidential. And I mm -hmm. think every American would understand that. You go back to the founding of our country, George Washington understood that. You know, mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson understood that, Alexander Hamilton. So they knew back then that there were going to be things that the presidents were going to have to do with, with secrecy and dispatch, right, mm -hmm. as, as they wrote in the Federalist Papers. So the interesting thing, though, is when you go back, you know, to the beginning, what you find was that there was only a very narrow and circumscribed number of secrets that uh, the early republic recognized and protected. Mm -hmm. So things like war plans, right? Things like mm -hmm. that, they understood with things that had to be kept secret. But what, what is striking to me is when you look at the, the rest of American history, the first 150 years, in fact, the US was much more transparent than any other comparable country in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, and also the United States kept very few secrets. We, we didn't generate a lot of secrets. There mm -hmm. was no central intelligence agency or anything like it. Every other self-respecting, even like a middling power, used to have what they call a black chamber to mm -hmm. intercept and decrypt communications, whether you know, between uh, diplomats you know, posted in your capital or between people you consider politically subversive. Not only did the United States have no such capacity until after the First World War, uh, but they actually made it a felony to intercept the mail and tamper with it, right? Mm -hmm. So the American people had a very high expectation you know, of uh, both that their government would be transparent and that they would be able to keep their privacy. And most of American history was like that. So this whole system of secrecy, which I think many of us with good reason would think, you know, it's like death and taxes. There's no escaping mm. it. Right. In fact, this is a relatively recent invention. And what that tells me is that it's not too late. You know, we mm -hmm. know how th things could be, how they could be otherwise. And I think it's not too late for us at least to try to return, you know, to our founding principles. Yeah, um, we're going to go there. I, I want to talk about the code breakers. I wore my uh, Rosetta Stone uh, tie here. So that because, uh, <laughs> breaking breaking the, that code was also, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me how the, the linguistic studies of the 19th and 18th centuries probably really helped the code breakers when, when it came time for, for that um, in the late 19th and 20th centuries. But um, that code breaking um, part of the secrets was something that they also wanted to keep secret. And you, as you said, I think that's one of the one of the things that's keep, kept the most secret is anything about code, how we break codes. So why don't you that's tell right. a little bit about what you uncovered there? Yeah, it's one of the few laws uh, that we have that regulates what information the public is allowed to know. For the most part, in fact, in almost every other instance, the president is fully sovereign over secrecy. Mm -hmm. You know, Donald Trump was not wrong when he said the president gets to decide what's secret and what isn't. He was wrong when he suggested that he could, with his own brain, <laughs> declassify documents. Right? I mean, because in fact, it's a very, you know, it's a very all too cumbersome process. You know, yeah. many people are involved. Enormous amounts of paper is generated, and I tell you, there's a chart in my book. It's, it's it looks a little bit like a Rube Goldberg machine. Mm -hmm. The process by which documents get declassified. It's incredibly complicated, but there are a few kinds of secrets where Congress has passed legislation. You know, to uh, make them, you know, secret uh, unless the president decides otherwise, and that includes information related to code making and code breaking. It includes mm -hmm. you know, the Atomic Energy Act, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which all the way back at the beginning, even before the Cold War, they're regulating what the public was allowed to know about nuclear weapons. And we also have a law, you know, to protect the identity of of covert operatives, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, Congress has, in fact, you know, acted occasionally and appropriately, right? And designated the things that I think all of us would understand need to be kept secret. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to things like code making and code breaking, a lot of what the NSA ultimately does, you know, is they hoover up, you know, enormous amounts of information. A lot of it is not encrypted, right? A lot of it is the mm -hmm. video conferences, right? Or, you know, text messages and email yeah. traffic, right? And they, they collect this, you know, uh, for example, at foreign data centers, you know, under a, a presidential, uh, this is a legal opinion by mm -hmm. the president's lawyer. Uh, it was written in 1984, and it's been used as as uh, as policy, as in fact, as you know, uh, as dispositive ever since. The NSA, when they collect data that is transmitted through foreign data centers, even if it's a web conference like mm -hmm. the one we're having now, it's fair game, mm -hmm. and they treat all of that as data that they have collected because it's foreign data. That they can then harvest and analyze uh, in order to uh, to meet their missions, and so this is something I think a lot of Americans aren't even aware of, right? And this, by the way, this to me is the most interesting part. This opinion is secret. Mm 
Even, <laughs> even Senator Feinstein, you know, very politely asked, is she be allowed to see a copy? She was not allowed to see a copy, at least as far as I know. I, I, yeah, I remember yeah. she very publicly asked to see this. Nobody has seen it. Right. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and it, the biggest secret it reveals is that someone in the bureaucracy must have a sense of humor having done it in 1984. <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> That's right. Not, not to be expected that they wouldn't. Well, let's let's date it. You know, we can they can always backdate it because nobody knows right. they could have made it. Dated yeah. in 83, whatever, or 85, but no, it had to be 1984. It's just yes. too funny. You know, and some, <laughs> of the, uh, so, some of the, you know, data that we do have, you know, like, for example, mm -hmm. we know the outcome of cases before the Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Courts. Um, it turns out there have been thousands and thousands of these where, you know, each time uh, government officials go to one of these courts that was set up back in the 70s when it was found the NSA was spying on a large scale on American citizens. Mm -hmm. Just people who are exercising their constitutional rights, you know, protests mm -hmm. the Vietnam War, you know, things of that nature. It made them targets of NSA surveillance. So back in the 70s, Congress passed a law where henceforth, if they were going to try to surveil people, especially citizens, they were going to have to get a court order. How many times do you think the court has denied them permission to spy on a citizen? Well, I've read your book, so I know the answer. <laughs> Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> in one case, in one case, they said, well, we don't think what you're asking for is something we can we can give you, but we'd like to suggest that you try this other thing, and mm -hmm. then we're going to let you do it. Right, right? Right, it's right. almost as I say, it's a little bit like imagine you had a, a soccer team, like even Arsenal, you know, doesn't have a record like this, you know, yeah. where they 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 played, you know, thousands of matches. They 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 score every game, right? They've never been scored on. And mm -hmm. in one case, it was actually the referee who kicked the ball into the goal. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the court that Congress set up to protect our rights as citizens to be free of government surveillance. Yeah, a little little bit of uh of form over substance there. Um, so I know that the audience will be fascinated to find out what your big data search says about the UFOs, uh, and, uh, Roswell, New Mexico. So, yeah. so what, you know, everyone thinks it's, uh, well, we're hiding aliens there and so on and so forth, but what, what is it that you found, um, was probably responsible for whatever was going on there? Yeah. Uh, well, in this case, I have to acknowledge a very smart uh, computer scientist named Hannah Wallach, because mm -hmm. she actually had the the brilliant idea of analyzing a collection of over 100,000 records that people were managed to, managed to get from presidential libraries. Mm -hmm. um, so this was information they got from the Freedom of Information Act or the equivalent mandatory declassification reviews. And so what she did, she had the clever idea. She used a technique they call it topic modeling. And mm -hmm. it was something invented by a colleague of mine and a co-author of mine, uh, Dave Bly. Um, and what it does is it allows you to cluster documents that are uh, similar in their language. And so you're able to you know, cluster documents that are more or less about nuclear weapons. You can cluster other documents that are more or less about UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can you know, cluster them in, on a whole range of other topics. And so she did this with this collection of over 100,000 declassified documents from presidential libraries. And then what she did is that she calculated how long it took on average for those records in each topic to get declassified. And so mm -hmm. what she found, I won't ask you, George, because you know the answer having read the book, but I'll ask the audience. So which of those two topics do you think took longer to get declassified? The ones related to nuclear weapons or the ones related to UFOs? It's amazing. It wasn't, it wasn't even close. It was yeah. 57 years, if I remember right, 57 years is how long it took on average for records related to nuclear weapons to get released to the American public. When it came to UFOs, 14 years, 14 mm -hmm. years. So as it turns out, it's not what you'd expect. It mm -hmm. turns out our government is quite happy to push out whatever information it has about UFOs. And you mm -hmm. know, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, just ask yourself, like we were talking earlier about, you know, this time in which, you know, Eisenhower had to fend off criticism about how the U.S. was going to be overwhelmed. You know, the Soviets, you know, had too many bombers, too many missiles. And, you know, when you watch the Hollywood movies, if that's all you knew about history, you would think, you know, the old cliche, like avoid panic. Right. So the right. Pentagon, the president, they're not going to tell us if they know they're extraterrestrials who are preparing to invade because they want to avoid panic. The fact is, the historical record shows over and over again. You know, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the president, in some cases, not Eisenhower, but other presidents, have been more than happy to panic the American people 
you know, to make them think that we have to need have to buy even more weapons, even more advanced weapon systems. Mm -hmm. So if they actually had evidence of an extraterrestrial threat, why the hell wouldn't they tell us? Yeah. I mean, instead of an eight hundred billion dollar Pentagon, I think we'd be having two trillion dollar Pentagon, <laughs> and we'd all be in uniform. <laughs> well, don't look up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, um, have I so convinced you, you, you don't George? Don't put that down to either incompetence or criminality <laughs> about the UFOs. It's just they, 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 uh, there's a little bit of, of, of the history there uh, in Roswell, New Mexico, that they just wanted to cover something up and they were happy for the UFO thing to give what, them cover, et cetera. What they were covering up in Roswell, it's actually pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a time, if I remember right, it was 1947. The UFO fans will correct me, and I'm going to be embarrassed. Yeah. I think it was 1947, 1948, one or the other. Um, and what was at Roswell, in fact, you know, was uh, the only base where they had the only squadron uh, in the entire American Air Force that was capable of delivering atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. Because amazingly, in this period, for a brief period after the Second World War, the United States really demobilized. You know, we went from like 12 million uh, men and women under on, in uniform to I think fewer than two million. Um, you know, the the Pentagon budget like cratered, um, and so for a brief period, the U.S. actually it was a, called a hollow threat. You know, the U.S. really had very few nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. and we had even fewer bombers capable of delivering these devices. So that's why Roswell. You know, if you had to pick one place that was holding like the holy of holies. You know, back mm -hmm. in that period, it was the place where we had these bombers, the few bombers that were ready to deliver uh, what was supposed to be the nuclear deterrent to to stop the Soviets from invading. And so they they were happy to pretend it was something else going on there. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if people believe that they were covering up, you know, extraterrestrials, they preferred that than mm -hmm. to acknowledge the reality, right? Mm -hmm. And I could understand, actually. I mean, I think it was important that they conceal that information <laughs> at the time. Now, what's yeah. strange is how even now, like, you know, sometimes even now people will redact and conceal numbers of nuclear weapons, even though these numbers have been disclosed, even in press conferences uh, at mm -hmm. other times. One other interesting fact, uh, the, uh, you know, during the 1970s, you know, the uh, U.S. began to build stealth bombers. And initially, this was a, a black program, right? It was they were building mm -hmm. them at the Skunk Works, this legendary, you know, facility, you know, also out in the desert, right, where they were uh, building planes that could uh, evade um, radar. Uh, some of these planes looked like flying saucers, mm -hmm. uh, and they realized that that was a useful cover story. And in fact, you know, it was subsequently revealed that they were seeding uh, the UFO community with stories about. Mm -hmm you know, these aircraft and claiming that they were on a, on a, unidentified flying vehicles and the government knew about it. And they were doing that precisely because they want to conceal the fact of the matter, which is that the U.S. was building these advanced bombers. So so the U.S. government will use disinformation when they choose to. Are you, are you claiming that it's not the Russians that put all that stuff into the Internet, that the United States government actually does it sometimes? Oh, well, the Russians, they, they pump out plenty of disinformation, too. I mean, the the whole, <laughs> you know, the idea that HIV AIDS, you know, is a biological warfare. Right. You know, they've, they've been quite skilled. Unfortunately, we fall for it. And with mm. good reason. Why? Because, you know, unfortunately, all too often, our government has concealed information about nefarious deeds. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when people ask, you know, isn't that a conspiracy theory? Well, unfortunately, it's not just a theory. <laughs> it's an empirically yeah. proven fact. You know, over and over again, we find people acting in secret and concealing criminal behavior. So you don't have to be a theorist. Like, you, you just have to look at the record. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's so much more in your book. We're running out of time here. But I want you to mention uh, that oftentimes uh, white supremacists use the, the secrecy in order to keep uh, racism issues bubbling where they wanted them to to and uh, and and so the secrecy and, was misused the, for that purpose too. And and the Russians do it too. Like yeah. it was disclosed after 2016, you know that one of the main things they're trying to achieve with their disinformation campaign and using social media is to see discord among the mm -hmm. American people to play on on racial divisions. And so you know that's why you know the, the fact that our government has you know completely disregarded and almost abandoned its legal responsibility to preserve public records and release them. It's it's why it is that we're all too vulnerable to these kind of disinformation campaigns. So this mm -hmm. is another way in which, you know, overclassification uh, is a national security threat. It makes it harder for us to protect secrets that really do have to be protected. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it just, you know, feeds, you know, this 
growing feeling among many Americans, well-meaning people, you know, who believe their government is, is capable of the worst if they haven't already done it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's an ancient issue of trust, you know, and uh, you, you, it's not that you have to be perfect. Um, but if you're, if you're untrustworthy, things are two or 3%. That's one thing. If you're untrustworthy, actions are 20%. It's another. So if like the P Pentagon, the CIA, you conceal uh, even after tw decades, you, mm -hmm. you withhold 90% of the records you review, mm -hmm. then what do you think people are going to suspect? Right? Right. Right. They're going to suspect. And, and sometimes for very good reason. Um, sometimes. But, but, yeah. uh, but uh, what's interesting about your book and what you uncover and what other people have done too in this thing, which is at least the good part of the news uh, about all this stuff, is that um, most of it is not um, so devious as it sounds. Most of it is is, is incompetence. Um, or and, banal. I and, mean, and, I or banal, use, yeah. The word Hannah Arendt was right about it, you know? Yeah. I would say, you know... Uh, you know, WikiLeaks, for example, you know, mm -hmm. quarter of a million diplomatic cables are released. For a few weeks, we had all these breathless stories about all the scandalous doings of American officials. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were very few scandals uncovered, and mm -hmm. most of them were the scandals of other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty soon reporters got tired of reading them because I can tell you, most of them are just not that interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> most of this stuff that's classified secret or even top secret, it's in many cases, it's information that's already known to the public. It mm -hmm. just doesn't have that top secret stamp. So this is something, you know, I, I have a chapter. I call it the 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 best kept secret in Washington. Yeah. It's the fact that so much of what's secret is actually not secret. Yeah. And and you 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 have great stories. It's almost like, you know, you keep it secret. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz. You know, you, you it's everything is behind the curtain and uh, and you find out what's behind the curtain is an old man <laughs> making <laughs> making things flash back and forth. Um, and that that's the secret that's kept. It's ironic because, uh, you know, uh, Pythagoras uh, went to ancient Egypt uh, and tried very hard to get into the secret, you know, Egyptian priest groups and stuff like that to learn their secrets. And uh, when he came out, he said that they don't have any they don't have any knowledge. You know, they don't <laughs> they're keeping this all secret and making everybody think that they know everything. But right. they really didn't know very much. You know, I mean, a couple of things. Yes. But, yeah. but most of it was for show. Legendary CIA analyst named Sherman Kent. He mm -hmm. said that all too many people in government, they only read classified information. And so that's all they know. In many cases, they don't know that a lot of that information is already well known outside of government. It's already public knowledge. He mm -hmm. called them innocents. And he said there are all too many of them at the CIA. So this is not normally how we think about our government. But unfortunately, it's all too true, all too often. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks a lot for first of all for writing the book and also showing that that uh, we can uncover our, our secrets in a different way. We can use the computerized uh, ability to to figure it out. I, I one point before we go, you know, digitalization of all of our information is supposed to be a great way of keeping it, but we know that digital information deteriorates, and actually, uh, books are uh, and paper hold their they don't hold they hold what you put in them. For much, much longer, even though the paper eventually deteriorates. Right. Um, so what do you think of that? That if, if all of our information is digitalized and right. it's not a matter of switching from word perfect, you know, to, to, to word or something like that, yeah. as you mentioned, it's a it's a, a physical deterioration as well. Um, yeah, they call it bit rot. You no, know, it's um, oh, very good. Yeah, I haven't heard that. That's great. Yeah, you yeah. have you have like legacy software, you have legacy mm -hmm. systems. And after a while, like, just think, what's your oldest email? You know, most of us, I think we know we were writing email. I was writing email in the 90s, right? right. I don't have any of that anymore unless I printed it out. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, I wrote this book. But but what I also do is I have this project called History Lab, and we built what we call the Freedom of Information Archive. And what mm -hmm. we're trying to do is we're trying to create what they call a data refuge. So mm -hmm. we're trying to, you know, create a way of maintaining this information in perpetuity, and we do that in partnership with Columbia Libraries, which has been mm -hmm. around actually. Columbia Library has been around longer than the United States of America. Yeah. So, so we work with them, the professionals, archivists, and librarians to try to preserve this information for the American people. And we also prepare it for you people out there who want to use like data science tools. We also give you direct access to the data. We have what's called an application programming interface. And this data is free and available to anyone who wants to explore it. Um, and so anyone who wants to support that mission, Reach out to me. <laughs> we get grants, but we don't get enough of them. 
<laughs> well, that's because the, who, who gives out the grants is the Department of Defense. <laughs> the big money. That's right. The big money. We get smaller grants from like the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation. Right. But there's a lot, lot we like to do that we, we can't do with government grants, you know, to be honest. Right. And so people are interested in this, check out our website. It's history-lab.org. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us, Professor Connolly. That is a great book, a very interesting di dive into not only what has been revealed in the past, but also this technological methods that being used to uncover what we really already should know, but don't. Thank you. So thanks again for joining us. Great being with you. Thanks, everyone, for listening.